<coughs> All right. Last time we were examining the expansion of Rome. And we saw Rome go from being a city state in central Italy to expanding to include all of Italy uh, and then fighting against the, 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 the empire of Carthage in North Africa. And uh, by the end of the Second Punic War, which ended in 202 BC, um, by the end of that war, um, Rome was at least the dominant power in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, was you know had, had established itself as one of the if, if, as one of the great powers of of the ancient world by defeating Carthage uh, in the Second Punic War. <coughs> now Rome would go on from there to keep on expanding, and today we're going to finish uh, how Rome's expansion, how they went from being a superpower to being the superpower. You know, by the time you get to the second century BC, you know, 100, by about 150, 140 BC or so, Rome was the hyper super giant power. I mean, there were other states that were still independent in the uh, lands bordering the Mediterranean, but they were all uh, played second fiddle to Rome. So Rome had established itself as a mighty empire by the second century BC. Now, what we're going to examine today is how Rome's expansion and growth as an empire uh, planted some seeds, and those seeds resulted in, well, destructive seeds that resulted in the overthrow of the Roman Republic. And uh, it's in a process that lasted over a century, it's called the Roman Revolution. Uh, Rome went from being a republic that we discussed and looked at, that uh, had evolved over time, it went from being a republic to being essentially a military dictatorship where power was concentrated in the hands of a man uh, with the support of a loyal military. And this situation resulted in Rome transitioning from being a republic to being an empire. And the, uh, the architect of that, uh, who made that transition, really kind of finished the process, was a man by the name of uh, Caesar. Uh, his, uh, actually there were two Caesars, his, the first Caesar, Julius Caesar, kind of got the ball rolling, and uh, he was assassinated in 44 BC, that was Julius Caesar, but it would be his uh, adopted son and his great nephew, uh, Caesar, Octavian Caesar, who became known to history as Augustus Caesar, who would uh, take this, this kind of create a new political system. He's, and uh, this pl new political system that he created, is, historians refer to as the Principate. Now, it was a system of government that was essentially a military dictatorship, but what the genius of Augustus was that he was able to give uh, a military tyranny a legitimacy by kind of dressing it up in the, all the forms and traditions of the Roman Republic. Remember, Romans were very traditional. So being ruled by a military dictator was something that most Romans would be find hard to swallow. So what Augustus did was to maintain the kind of like the illusion that the republic was still alive and that the, the traditions of the republic were being followed. But really, in effect, you had power concentrated in, in his person. He had the support of the military, and that's how he ruled. But you had all these, these uh, offices and traditional practices were followed. So from the perspective of the people of Rome, Rome was still a republic. Even though it wasn't a republic, power was in the hands of the dictator, the, the emperor, as he became known to history, the imperator, or emperor. We get the word emperor from imperator. So, so that's what we're going to look at today as well, and hopefully. And uh, now, the, one of the great achievements of Augustus Caesar in creating the Principate was that his, his, he was an architect of a system of government that provided Rome with security and peace and prosperity that lasted for over 200 years. And it's called the, the Roman peace, the Pax Romana. And it was a time when the Roman Empire was flourishing very, very strongly. And you had trade <coughs> and peace, and, and uh, you had an empire that stretched from, from, the, from the North Sea to the Sahara, from the Atlantic to Mesopotamia, and it was uh, and it was a very prosperous time in uh, the history of the world. In fact, uh, centuries later, uh, the, uh, in the 18th century, an English historian, Gibbon, 
in the 18th century referred to the Roman Empire as the as a time when the, the people enjoyed the greatest prosperity that they'd ever enjoyed ever, even counting the 18th century. <laughs> so so it was looked down it was looked upon by subsequent centuries as a as a kind of golden age of peace and prosperity. And now the the uh, Roman peace also corresponds with a time that saw the the growth of Christianity and uh, the uh, and and the two are related in the sense that it was the peace and security provided by the Roman Empire that allowed Christianity to grow very rapidly uh, using Roman roads. You know those same Roman roads that kept the peace and promoted trade also allowed missionaries to travel without danger over large areas and spread their their gospel. So so the uh, Pax Romana also provided a, a uh, an incubator of sorts for the rise of a new world religion, Christianity. So uh, I don't know if we're going to get that far today, but, but definitely we'll get there uh, on, uh, next week on Monday. But uh, those are the, the topics we're going to be treating. All right, now, so let's talk about, about Roman expansion. And just to, I think I have a map here that works here. Let me show you. Now this is a nice map because you can see the expansion of Rome over time. So like, um, now at the time of the Second Punic War, and started in 218 BC, let's see how the Roman Empire looked. Now if you looked at the, if, if you looked at the empire in, at the beginning of the Second Punic War, Rome, the Roman Empire was only uh, consisted of Italy and Sicily and basically that was, that was it. But you, uh, you move forward a bit, and you go to 100 BC, and you see that the Roman Empire has expanded to include uh, um, North Africa, uh, it includes Spain, uh, parts of Gaul, um, uh, Italy, Greece, and Asia Minor. So the empire expanded uh, greatly. And then, by the time you get to the time of, of Augustus Caesar, the guy who founded the Principate, uh, who got the Pax Romana started, now you can see the Roman Empire has expanded even more to include Egypt, Egypt and uh, Palestine and Syria, uh, and uh, all of Gaul, what is today France, and even into uh, uh, parts of what today would be, be Germany and uh, Austria and the Balkan area. So, so this would be to represent the empire at its, not its full extent, and eventually it would expand a little bit farther, but you can see that it grew very rapidly uh, by the time you get to the time of Christ. All right, so that's the, uh, kind of give you a, a picture in your mind of the Roman Empire and its expansion throughout the Mediterranean. And uh, now this map is online on your PowerPoint slide, so you, you can link to it and kind of play around with it and uh, use it if you want to for, for study purposes. All right, now, we closed uh, talking about Rome's empire with uh, what happened in, uh, after the Battle of Zama. The Battle of Zama was fought in North Africa near Carthage. That was the battle which Hannibal finally lost, and I was going to tell you a story. I like this story because it's kind of Hannibal, kind of, in a nutshell, tells you something about Hannibal. Uh, um, after the battle, Hannibal was in discussions with Scipio Africanus, the guy who defeated him. And they were just kind of uh, shooting the shooting the bull, whatever, and discussing. And Scipio said to Hannibal, uh, "Could you tell me who you think are the, the greatest generals in history?" And uh, Hannibal said, "Well, you know, Alexander the Great. You know, he obviously was number one. You know, nobody could match him." And and I'd have to put Pyrrhus in there. You know, he was never never lost a war. He lost that one battle against you all, but that was it. And then I'd have to put myself as number three. And Scipio said, well, hey, where'd you, where would you put me? You know, I, I defeated you. And he said, man, if I want, defeated you in battle, I'd be number one. So he, uh, that's, that's kind of Hannibal. He, was, he wasn't a shy man or a man of humility whatsoever. But, but he lost. And uh, the, the, the Carthage lost the Second Punic War. And Rome had established itself as the dominant power, at least in the West. Now... During that, that last second, during that last war, during the Second Punic War, 
uh, when Rome was really down, after their, when, their, when their armies had been defeated and Rome was under siege, uh, a man by the name of Philip V. Now, Philip V was the ruler of Macedon, and uh, he was the, a descendant of one of the generals of Alexander the Great. He was a descendant of Antigonus, he's an Antigonid. And uh, Philip V, uh, he ruled over uh, Macedon and, and uh, much of Greece, and uh, he was concerned with the rise of Rome, because Rome and Macedon shared you know, the Adriatic Sea. They both were along that, that sea. And so when he saw that Rome was down, he saw an opportunity to kind of uh, strengthen his own hand. So he made an alliance with Carthage in the middle of the Second Punic War. And uh, so Rome found itself at war with yet another enemy. Now, when Carthage had been defeated after the Battle of Zama in 202 BC and the Second Punic War was over, now Rome decided to, to, to teach this guy, Philip, a lesson because he had declared war on them when they were at, at their lowest mark. So, so Rome decided right after defeating and winning the Second Punic War, they went right into another war, this time against Macedon, against Philip V. And uh, this war was a war that at first didn't really go well for Rome. You see, Rome had an advantage in the sense that we've mentioned this earlier. They could lose a lot of men, but they could always find new recruits. They had a, a lot of plentiful soldiers to draw from, from their Italian allies, from their Roman citizens themselves. Now eventually, uh, at the Battle of Kinocephali in, in 196 BC, it was fought in northern Greece. At this battle, uh, this is the last, the first and the last time that Philip V was defeated. And it was a, it was a terrible blow because he lost his phalanx. Now the thing about Philip was that when he lost his best troops, he couldn't replace them. He didn't have the manpower that the Romans had. So when his phalanx was kind of cut to ribbons by the Roman legions, uh, it was one of those cases where the Romans were used their tactic. It was a tactical thing. The Romans were able to lure the phalanx to fight on uneven ground, on hilly country. And once they were on, une on hilly ground, the phalanx, which was pretty solid, hard to defeat, the phalanx kind of broke up, and, there were, and the Romans sent their, their, their uh, infantry in there, their uh, lighter infantry, in the, into the cracks, basically, and just, you know, took their Spanish swords and hacked the, Rome, the Macedonians all up to pieces. So it was, a, uh, it was a great victory for Rome and a terrible blow to Philip. He had to <coughs> keep for peace. And uh, the Romans, uh, now the Romans allowed him to become the king of Macedon. They didn't overthrow him. But they declared that he now had to liberate all of the Greek city-states. All the Greek city-states that he ruled were now free and independent. And Rome thought that they could just walk away. You know, we, we defeated Philip, uh, we don't, we're not interested in conquering Greece, now we're going to go home. But what happened was that the situation in Greece attracted another king. His name was Antiochus III. Now Antiochus III was another one of these kings who was descended from the successors of Alexander the Great. He was, uh, a, he was descended from Seleucus. He, he was a Seleucid. And he ruled up, he was a very successful ruler. He, his empire stretched all the way to India, and uh, he ha had, had enjoyed a lot of great success. And when he heard about Philip V's problem, that Philip V had been defeated, and the Greek city-states were now free, he saw this as an opportunity to advance his own interests into Greece. You know, he, he wanted Greece for himself, because he figured if he ruled Greece, that would always provide him with a, a steady flow of troops for his armies. So he, he, he went, entered into Greece, hoping to capitalize on Philip V's problems. Now the Romans were thinking, hey look, we don't want another big enemy. We had to deal with, we had to deal with Carthage, we had to deal with this Philip guy, and now this Antiochus III, Mr. who called himself Antiochus the Great, now he is moving in, muscling his way in, now he's a threat. So the Romans declared war on him. Uh, and told them to get lost. They told them, hey, Greece is independent. We, we granted them their independence, and we're not going to let you muscle your way in here. Um, Romans always fancy themselves the liberators. You know, we're here to spread free freedom and liberty to all. You know? So the Romans were like, we, we are not going to allow you to tyrannize, be tyrants over Greece. So, so the Romans went in there, and they eventually they, they defeated Antiochus III. He had the same problem. At the Battle of Magnesia, you know, it was fought, 
uh, in, uh, in Asia Minor, in what is today Turkey. And it was a battle in which, again, uh, the Romans were able to win the day. And the and Seleucus, I mean, Antiochus III, the Seleucid king, really had no, once he had lost a big chunk of his army, he couldn't recover. You know, he didn't have, uh, he, had, he relied on mercenaries. He had to go out and buy and train and get a whole new army. And wh when he lost his army at Magnesia, he had to sue for peace. So he was told to go to back to Syria and, and to let, and to free all of his, not Asia Minor and Greece and, and to be gone. And so he made peace with Rome, and he was humiliated, and that was the end of that. So in a span of uh, oh, in a little over a decade, the Rome, Rome had defeated and humiliated two of the great powers of the Eastern Mediterranean, the Philip V and uh, Antiochus III. Now, what happened, though, was that uh, Philip V had a son named Perseus. Now, Perseus, uh, Perseus um, wanted to restore the glory of his kingdom, and, and uh, he didn't want to play second fiddle to Rome. So he was able to uh, get a bunch of Greek city-states to support him. He was able to win the support of some Balkan tribes, uh, and some tribes in what is say the Balkans and, and Thrace, and he was able to, he had lots of money. His, his father had left him a large sum, a, a, a full treasury. So he had the money and the forces, and he decided to challenge Rome. Now he didn't want to conquer Rome, he just wanted to be independent and Restore the glory that was Macedon, but the Romans went, the Romans were thinking, hey, we can't allow this. We can't allow this guy to to run things. Uh, this 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 guy will be a threat to us, just like Hannibal was a threat, just like his father was a threat. We need to neutralize this threat. So so Rome went to war um, against uh, against Perseus, and th they beat him too. It was a it was a long war. But you see, eventually, Perseus ran out of money and ran out of men, and eventually he had to sue for, sue for peace. Actually, at the Battle of Pydna, uh, he was defeated. Pydna was a, one of the major cities of Macedon. It was a royal capital. It was captured. Uh, eventually, Perseus was captured. Now, after the defeat of Perseus, the Romans decided that uh, Macedon could not be ruled by kings anymore. It was, it was too dangerous for Rome. So what they decided to do was to end the Macedonian monarchy and make Macedon into a Roman province. So it was the first time where Rome had decided that they were going to conquer a people where that was very alien, that was, spoke a different language completely than the Romans did. You know, a land beyond Italy itself. So, so now Italy, uh, now the Romans had expanded uh, into, uh, into Greece and taken it over. Now, um, eventually, the Romans had to deal some other threats as well. Um, after they eliminated the Macedonian monarchy, there there arose a, uh, a a false king, a man who claimed to be a son of Perseus. He was called the False Philip, and he claimed to be the king of Macedon. And he started a rebellion about 149 BC, and some of the Greek city-states who didn't like being run, told by Rome what to do, they. The Achaean League, or the League of Greek City-States in the Peloponnese, they, they joined up in a war against Rome. And uh, at the same time, the Romans decided that uh, Carthage, which they allowed to remain independent after defeating it in the Second Punic War, that Carthage had recovered and was posed a threat to Rome's interests. So in about between 149 and 146 BC, Rome fought two wars in two areas. They fought a war in Greece, which they basically resulted in uh, destroying the Achaean League and uh, destroying one of its main cities of Corinth. And they also uh, waged war against Carthage in what's called the Third Punic War. And eventually they, uh, they decided to destroy Carthage completely. They, they just decided to wipe it off the map. They, they killed all of its male inhabitants and sold all the women and children into slavery. And they just completely destroyed the city. And they even put a curse on anybody who would refound the city of Carthage. So they, uh, they just demolished Carthage. So, so by the time you get to 146 BC, Rome had established itself after defeating the, the Carthage and destroying Carthage and eliminating all opposition in Greece. Rome was the um, master of the Mediterranean. Now, these wars, 
though, had an impact because over time these wars created a host of problems for Rome and these problems would eventually result in uh, the Romans becoming very disenchanted and unsatisfied with their traditional leadership. And that would lay the foundation for uh, Rome replacing their republic with a military dictatorship. <clears throat> um, that's, that's one of the big problems with democracy or any kind of constitutional government is that uh, when people don't, aren't happy with it, then a lot of times they think the answer is some kind of strong, powerful, authoritarian government that's going to solve all your problems, whether it be the Nazi Germany or the fascists in Italy or what happened in Rome. And that's what we're going to look at next. All right. So, oh, oops, what happened? What did I do? All right, so what we're going to do now is look at this Roman Revolution, this uh, period that saw the overthrow of the Roman Republic and its replacement by a, a military dictatorship. All right, now, so what are the problems? So before you can understand what, what, why Roman, Romans became dissatisfied with their system of government or with the traditional leadership, you have to look at the problems facing Rome. One of the problems facing Rome was that uh, it saw a vast expansion of its poor people. Uh, you know, Rome had always been a country that prided itself on its uh, farmers. The fact that the Ro your typical Roman citizen was a family farmer, owned and operated a small farm. And, and that was, and these farmers were the ones who that the Rome relied on to fight its wars, to, to make up the, the, the infantry. And um, what we see happening is that uh, during, as a result of Rome's conquests, um, Rome's yeoman farmers disappeared. They became extinct, almost. And instead of having a bunch of uh, freedom-loving farmers, Rome was, had a bunch of masses of people living in poverty, being highly unemployed, living in the city of Rome. And it was called the proletariat. Now, the, the, it comes from the word proles. Proles means offspring. And, and uh, in the Roman system of government, the, when they did the census, the poorest people who had no money and could not be taxed because they had nothing to tax, they were called the prole, the proletariat, because all they could offer was they could make babies. All they could do was make children. They didn't have any money, they didn't have any property. They lived from hand to mouth, from day to day. And, and Rome became full of all these poor Romans living in the city of Rome. Um, Rome went from being a city of a tiny little town uh, in the about the beginning of the third century, Rome was still a tiny town. But by the time you get to about 100 BC, 100 BC, 50 BC, Rome had grown to having a population that some people estimate to be a million people. A million people. And most of them were dirt poor, living in utter poverty, living in tenement houses that were 10 stories high, and it was, and it was just a mess. Rome was just overcrowded and filled with all these poor people. Now what happened? Why were, why were all these people poor? Well, you see, what had happened is that um, by the time you get to the third century BC and into the second century BC, more and more Rome fought wars that took Roman citizens away from their farm families, away from their farms, and Romans were fighting wars in Spain. You know, when after the Second Punic War, they acquired Spain, and they had to fight all these wars in Spain. They had to fight wars in Greece. So that meant that that Roman Roman farmers were not at home raising their farms. They were they were off fighting these wars in distant countries. And when they came back, sometimes they'd be gone for years. And when they came back, their farms were in disrepair. A family farm is a, a farm that's meant to be run by a family, right? So if the, if the, male, if the males are gone, then maybe the, maybe the oldest son and the dad are gone, and the small children and the wife and the sisters are left to run the farm, that's, that's, that's a lot of hardship for them. And what often would happen when these guys came back um, they were used to a life of adventure. You know, they, as soldiers, they got to pillage and rape and burn and kill and have a great old time. And now they're supposed to come home and, 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 and raise a derelict farm. And a lot of them were like, screw this, let's move to town! And they moved to the big city because what had happened is that because of all this uh, wealth coming in from Rome's conquest, there, there, there was money in, in town. I mean, not a lot of money, but, but there were jobs and and opportunities for those who could find them. So a lot of Roman 
uh, farmers just sold their farm, moved to Rome, and tried to find their fortune there. And now the problem with living in Rome was that you lived in cramped conditions and tenement houses, and and basically work was intermittent. You know, there was no job security whatsoever. You might find a job, you might not find a job. So it was very unsettled. So Rome became had a situation where you had the disappearance of its family farms and the replacement by all these masses of people living in poverty and being highly unemployed, living in the big city. Now, the growth of the proletariat destroyed the old system, the patron-client system now. Because now, I mean, you, you, uh, uh, if you were a patron, you had no clients, traditional clients, because all the family farmers were gone. But Rome's, Rome, that these proletariat were still voters, you see. They still were in the assemblies, they still voted, and, they, and Roman politicians discovered with the growth of the proletariat, the only way that you could win their vote was just by buying the vote. They were dirt poor, right? So give them food, give them parties, give them banquets, uh, give them cash, and you'll get elected. So, so the growth of the proletariat invited a lot of corruption because it created a system where Roman politicians, in order to get elected, had to throw a lot of gifts at the proletariat just to get them to vote. And the proletariat knew that their livelihood often depended upon getting their particular politician uh, into office. So what happened is that a lot of times, see, Rome didn't have a police force, didn't have any kind of uh, system like that. So a lot of times, uh, rival politicians would create their own gangs. And the gangs would like try to intimidate their opponents to try to get their guy to win. So, so politics, instead of being done in a civil fashion, politics became more and more violent and more and more corrupt, where it was about throwing money around and getting your gang to beat the crap out of your, your rival's gang to get the votes to, to win the election. Now, this, this created uh, a, like a wave of problems because, you see, politicians now to get elected, they had a lot of cash. They had to throw out a lot of money to get elected. So where do you get money? Well. The way the politicians got money was by um, getting lucrative jobs in the empire and then just basically uh, squeezing any cash they could from their subjects. You see, in this Roman system, once you held, if you were a proconsul, if you were a, excuse me, if a consul or a praetor, the way that they worked it out, once you were a consul, you become a proconsul. And a proconsul would be a governor of one of Rome's provinces. So, so the way it would work would be this way. If you were running, running for office, you'd borrow a lot of money from whoever you could borrow money from, go tons of money into debt, and then win the election. And then once you had served your year in office in Rome, you would go to the provinces, you would go to your designated province where you're supposed to govern, and then you'd just use corruption to squeeze as much money as you can. I mean, Roman, Romans developed a reputation for great cruelty, and, and because they, they would take their armies and use their armies to squeeze money out of their subjects. Like they would surround the village and say, give me everything you have or we're going to kill you. And then the guy would pocket the money because he had to pay off all his debts to cover all of his campaign expenses. See how that works? And so when, when, when the Romans, the subjects of Rome hated the Romans because the Roman governors had a reputation for being so corrupt and squeezing money out of them. And they would accept bribes. You know, any, any way that they could get money, they would get money because they were so much in debt because they had to go in debt to get elected. So it was a system that invited lots of corruption, and it, it, was, it was bad for Rome, bad for Roman provinces, bad for, for Roman's political system. Now, another thing that happened is that, you see, when all these farmers sold their land, they would sell them to big landowners. And so, uh, so you had a situation where Rome was dominated by these big, giant landowners, and, and there were these big plantations called latifundia. Oh, God bless. Now, but these latifundia were these big plantations. You see, because there was because the Rome's population was growing so fast, there was a huge demand for grain and oil, you know, olive oil and wine. And so these plantations made a lot of money uh, for providing for Rome's uh, giant population. Now, the reason why these latifundia were so profitable is because of slavery. You see, what, as Rome expanded. Um, they would, uh, every time Rome fought a war, they would enslave thousands of people. Like, for example, when they defeated Perseus in 168 BC, after the Battle of Pydna, to, to punish the allies of Perseus, the Romans um, basically enslaved much of the population 
of the land of Epirus, which had been allied with, with Perseus. And 150,000 people were sold into slavery. That's just one example. Now, also, the Romans allowed pirates to, to <coughs> roam the seas uh, because the pirates were, would kidnap people and sell them into slavery. Now, you'd think, why would Romans want that? Well, because these, these pirates would go in and, and kidnap people and then sell them to Roman landowners. And then, and then so Roman landowners would have all these cheap slaves. So the island of Delos, for example, in, uh, in the Aegean, was a, a big place where pirates would go to sell their slaves, that they, their, their, their people they'd captured. We're told by our sources that in, in, 100, in 100 BC, it was not unusual for 10,000 people to be sold a day as slaves. Now, all these slaves were from all over the Mediterranean they would end up working in these latter flimmies. And, and, and the slaves are so cheap that these slave owners didn't care how they treated them. They figured, hey, if they die, we'll just buy some new ones. They're so cheap, right? Question. Did they, did they not have almost more slaves than, I mean, than what, you know, I mean, were there more slaves than there were people of Rome? I mean, yeah, it was getting that way. Yeah, yeah. There were, there were, places, there were, there were places in Italy and, and where you, you didn't see anybody, you didn't see anybody but slaves. Mm -hmm. You had all the Roman citizens living as proletariat in the cities, and you had all these big latifundia operated by slave labor. And these people, they got to the point where they, see, they didn't care about their lives, right? It's because they were so cheap. So they would work them to death. Sometimes they, they, these, these slaves would, would work till they would literally work to death. Because they didn't care. They figured out oh, the guy will get a new one. And that's how they worked. Now, you can't treat people like that without paying the cost. And so what you see happening over time was that the, the slave rebellions became more and more violent and disruptive. And uh, probably the greatest slave rebellion was led by uh, Spartacus. And I think they made an HBO movie. Has anybody seen that movie? Yeah. It's a series. A series? It's really good. It's, I, I don't know if the series is. I haven't seen the series. I don't have HBO. It's but, pretty decent. Is it good? Yeah. <laughs> well, Spartacus was a, uh, uh, was a, was a uh, Thracian, and he was a gladiator. And what happened is that uh, you know, a lot of times they'd use as, as gladiators. You know, as Rome, one way, gladiators began, what you mentioned, as, as human sacrifices on the graves of dead men. But by the time we get to uh, 200 to 100 BC or so, uh, gladiator combat became a form of entertainment. So whenever you had a holiday, whenever you were honoring the memory of somebody, uh, somebody would throw gladiatorial games. And so it became a part of public entertainment. It became a way of, if you're a politician and you wanted to, uh, earn a name for yourself, you'd have a big gladiatorial combat. And a lot of times they would, they would use slaves because slaves were cheap. They'd train the slaves to fight and then they'd use them for entertainment purposes. And Spartacus was, was, a, was a Thracian who was trained as a gladiator, but he started a, uh, a, gladi he started a rebellion. His, his gladiators who were in a school rebelled and uh, they went up into the mountains, Mount Vesuvius up in southern Italy, and, uh, and a lot of runaway slaves joined them and so pretty soon they had an army of 100,000 men. And Spartacus turned out to be a pretty good general. And uh, for a number of years, between 76 and 71 BC, Spartacus' armies waged war against Rome. In fact, uh, they defeated two large Roman armies and came close to even capturing Rome itself. So, and eventually, it wasn't until 71 BC that uh, the Romans finally defeated Spartacus. And thousands upon thousands of, of, of Spartacus' Uh, rebel slaves were crucified. The, the story goes that, that from the city of Rome all the way to the, the coast for, for miles and miles, all you saw were crucified slaves, where they would actually, crucifixion goes back to the Phoenicians, but the Romans adopted the practice from the Phoenicians and used it uh, as a way of punishing uh, rebel slaves or anybody who was a, uh, a rebel. So, so uh, thousands upon thousands of people were uh, were. Uh, were killed. Now it's, it's funny uh, because I have to tell the story because uh, they made a movie a couple years ago with Kirk Douglas as Spartacus, and his love interest, of course, had to be a beautiful girl, right? But I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. Hollywood movies, they always have to have pretty girls. But according to the ancient sources, Spartacus did have a love interest, but she was this incredibly large woman who claimed to be a prophetess and to speak with the gods. And he used her, and any time there was a problem, he'd say, let the prophet speak, and she'd be going to a trance, you know, and she would like, uh, and she was his wife. And I guess she was incredibly ugly, 
and, and huge, but, uh, but she had all this power because she was this prophetess. Anyway, so they, they didn't put that in a Hollywood movie, I bet. <laughs> you know, the HBO series, his wife was like, you know, pretty good looking, but she still kind of like admired the gods or whatever. Yeah, it yeah. Kind of started him off as like a uh, like a general in the Thracian army, and then. Yeah, some people think slayer. that there's there's a speculation that he might have, since he was such a good general, that as a when he was in his native country, he might have actually been in some kind of military position, and that might explain his success in commanding all these thousands, of, turning them into an army that was that enjoyed some success. Yeah. All right, so so you had all these. So Rome was a mess. You know, you had you had uh, the the cities, uh, a lot of corruption, a lot of violence in the cities. You had slaves living in the countryside, and the, the always the threat of slave rebellion. Uh, but it was more than that. Uh, on top of everything else, you had wealthy Romans who were unhappy and dissatisfied. Now it's one thing if poor people are unsatisfied, because you can always you know they're poor. Who cares? But when rich people get mad, that's when you get problems. Because rich people can throw their money around, you know. That's and what happened was that 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 because of Rome's expansion, it had created opportunities for Romans to make huge sums of money. Now, in, in the Roman the Roman system, the the wealthiest Romans who paid the highest taxes were called equestrians because they they owned horses. Uh, we get the word it comes from the word equus. Now. Uh, now, the term equestrians came to be referred to wealthy Romans who had lots of money but didn't belong to the Roman noble class. Remember, the Roman nobles were closed. They weren't closed. I mean, you could, they always welcomed new members, but they were kind of a, the blue bloods. You know, they were the, the patricians with some plebeians added. And to join that club, it took a lot of work and it was a difficult process. But, but they were very kind of uh, dismissive of wealthy people who didn't have their lineage, their ancestors. So, so you had all these wealthy Romans and wealthy Italians who were making huge sums of money, and yet they, they were looked down upon by the Roman senatorial class, the Roman senators. And they hated that. They wanted some kind of influence. Now, how did they make their money? Well, one of the ways they made their money was through tax farming. Um, in, Rome, in Rome, instead of having the government collect taxes, they didn't have the the, they didn't have the infrastructure to have, have taxes collected by officials. They didn't have a big bureaucracy. So what they did was they would, they would the companies would organize themselves, private companies, and they would put out bids to collect taxes. And the, the publicans, what they would do is they would put out a bid. They'd say, we'll give you, we'll collect this much tax money. And the profit they would make would be the difference between what they collected and what they promised to give the Roman state. See, this system invited a lot of corruption because if you were a Republican, you wanted to squeeze as much tax dollars as you could out of the subjects because you had to honor your bid, but you also wanted to make a little profit on the side, you know, a lot of profit if you could, and they didn't make a lot of profit. So, so Republicans uh, earned a, a reputation for being very, very unscrupulous, you know, doing, you know, being you know, very greedy and squeezing as much money as they could. And that's why uh, in the, even in the first century, in the time, if you read the New Testament, you know, whenever they talk about sinners, they always include publicans. Because publicans were always uh, considered to be so evil. And uh, tax collectors, and people who you know, basically did whatever they could to make a buck. And, uh, and, and if you were, and, and from the eyes of the Jews, of course, the first century also considered traitors, because they were working with the, the Roman uh, the Roman tyrants. Now, but but publicans provided tax farming provided a, re a way for for Romans to make huge sums of money. Now, this is another thing they could do. What Roman what Roman tax farmers would do, they would they would charge these huge taxes, and if a city or a subject people could not pay the tax, they'd say, "Look, we'll loan you the money to pay the taxes at twenty percent interest, and then you can and then you can pay us back." And so they could they could kind of be bankers as well as tax collectors. So they would loan people the money and, and then to pay off their taxes, and then they'd collect the interest on the loan. So they were getting the tax money and the interest on the loan at the same time. Now, a lot of these publicans were also putting their money into the latter fundia. They were the ones who were buying up the slaves, selling them to Italy, or, or buying up the huge estates. So there are all kinds of opportunities for, for people to make lots of money in this Roman system. And so you have these equestrians. But these, this new money 
they were looked down upon by the old money. They were looked down upon by the traditional Roman nobles, the Roman elite. And so they hated it. And these equestrians wanted power and influence to equal their great wealth. It's so, amazing that things haven't changed. I mean, honestly, I mean, the old money still looks down on you. Oh, yeah, that's, that's one of the classic. Like today. That's true, that's true. Uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's been true throughout history. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> now, now, what, what got the, the Roman Revolution going? You know, you had all these problems, right? And what happened was that eventually these problems would lead to political um, crisis, a political crisis. And uh, the, the Roman Revolution, the, 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 the traditional date that marks the beginning of the Roman Revolution is the political career of Tiberius Gracchus in 133 BC. Tiberius Gracchus came from one of these uh, traditional families. He was, he was plebeian, but he belonged to the Roman nobles. He was from a traditional Roman family, even though he was of plebeian origin. And uh, he was concerned with the fate of his country because the way he saw it was you had all these foreign slaves working in the countryside, and the Roman farmer was disappearing. And he believed that what the, the heart and soul of the Roman Republic was the Roman farmer. And he believed if we don't have Roman farmers, as he went, he thought to himself, Who's going to be in our army? Because we need our soldiers to be farmers. If we don't have citizen farmers to be our soldiers, we won't have an army anymore. So from his perspective, he had to find a way to solve this problem. So he came up with an idea. His idea was that in Rome, in, uh, throughout Italy, you had all this land that had been acquired over the years by Roman conquest. And it was public land. And he wanted to take this land and to divide it up into like 500 acre lots let's say, or a, hundred, a couple hundred acre for lots, and give it to all the landless people of Rome, so that people who were the proletariat could now have farms of their own. And that was his idea. Now, this is where he got into trouble. He went to the Senate first, because he was a traditional Roman, and it turned out that some of these senators were making a lot of money, because they were basically farming this public land and paying a very little small amount of rent but collecting all the income that came from collecting, you know, harvesting the crops from that land. So you had all these Roman senators who were making all this money from this public land uh, and paying these very minimal rents to the, to the public treasury. So uh, when he presented this pro proposal, some of the senators said, ah, forget it, you know, there's a lot of money, in a lot of senators have money in this land, don't do it. So he said, by God, I don't care, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. So he took his case directly to, he ignored the Senate, and he took his case directly to the, the plebeian assembly. So he went to the plebeian, he's a tribune of the people, elected tribune, so he takes his case to the plebeian assembly. Well, see, Rome has a system of checks and balances. So when he presents his proposal, this, this other tribune, who, who's being paid off by the senators, he vetoes, he, said he, he vetoes Tiberius. You know, because tribunes can veto other, ve other tribunes. Now, at this point, Tiberius Gracchus did something that nobody had done before, something very untraditional. He says, this other tribune is going against the will of the people. So I, I take a vote that he be kicked out of office. Now, there is nothing in the Roman Constitution that allowed a tribune to get kicked out of office. So, I mean, there, it, there was nothing in the Constitution. This is a completely unparalleled situation. So, so Tiberius Gracchus said, this guy is going against the people, so let's kick him out of office. So they, they took a vote, they voted to kick him out of office, and he was, when he refused to leave, he said, you can't do this. This isn't, this isn't in the Constitution. They, they, a bunch of guys grabbed him and pulled him off, and threw him down, and his, his supposedly tribunes were inviolate. Their person was sacred. They couldn't be, when they were serving as tribunes, they couldn't be seized or attacked. So this was seen, this attack on this other tribune, was seen as a great uh, threat, a, a, a break with tradition. So Tiberius Gracchus was on, was walking on rocky ground. So then after all this, he, he finally got his proposal passed, but, but then he decided to do something that nobody else had ever done before. He decided to run for another term as tribune. Nobody had ever done that before. You were supposed to serve as tribune, go into the Senate, and then go to the next job. But he wanted to serve a second year as tribune. Well, Roman senator said, this guy is a threat. This guy wants to make himself a tyrant. He's a demagogue. He wants to get the people behind him so he can be a king. 
And so the, tri the senators decided that they were going to do something a little bit unheralded. They said, we're declaring a state of emergency. And Tiberius Gracchus is a public enemy number one because he's violating the Constitution. Of course, by declaring a state of emergency and doing this, they were violating the Constitution as well. So, but anyway, that didn't matter to them. So they sent guys, a bunch of senators, grabbed some clubs, and these are senators. And they walked up to Tiberius Gracchus and they just beat him to death. He was beaten to death by senators. The story is, is that when, when he, was, he was surrounded by his bodyguard, when he saw these senators and their togas coming up with big old pieces of wood, they all backed away, and they grabbed Tiberius, they beat him to death, and they threw him in the Tiber River. They didn't even bury the guy. They just threw him in the Tiber. They didn't even give him the, the honor of a burial. And everybody was so shocked by that 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 was the end of that. And that was the end of Tiberius Gracchus. And, uh, and then once he was dead, they declared the end of the emergency over, and that was the end. But... A lot of people remembered everything Tiberius had done. Now, Tiberius had a younger brother named Gaius Gracchus. Now, Gaius Gracchus decided that he was going to carry on the legacy of his brother. And he had a big plan. He wanted to take all these proletariat, and he wanted to give them land uh, in Italy, and then he wanted to establish a Roman colony at Carthage and in other areas, and give all this land to the proletariat. But he knew he needed to expand his base. So what another thing he did was he, he, made a, he, he declared that from now on, all Roman proletariat could get free bread, free grain from the Roman state. They'd be provided with free grain. And uh, he also announced a plan that uh, he was going to build all these roads and all these public buildings in Rome. And all these equestrian, wealthy equestrians were going to get government contracts to build all these roads. You know, a little stimulus program. To, to put people back to work. So he's gonna, he, he, he was going to create a lot of jobs. He was going to get free grain to the poor. He was going to establish land for Romans poor. And, and so he had, he had basically reached out to all the dissatisfied people around the proletariat, the equestrians who profited from all these contracts, and, uh, and, and poor Roman farmers. And he was very successful. <coughs> and, and he ran after he served his first year in office in 123, he ran for a second year and won. And then he decided to run for a third year as tribune. And he was the most powerful man in Rome. And these senators were thinking, this guy, this guy's a danger, man. He's, he's, he's going to become our king. He runs the city because he's got all these masses doing his bid. So the Romans decided, we've got to teach this guy a lesson. The Roman Senate decided, we need to do to Gaius what we did to Tiberius. So in 121 BC, they declared a state of emergency. And this time, the senators went out there, but this time, the, the Gaius and his followers weren't going to back him down. So instead of Tiber the Gaius Gras Gracchus dying and getting assassinated, you had a full-on street battle. They raged on for days. And it went by, when it was all over, there were 600 dead men. And all, most of them were followers of Gaius. Gaius was killed. Most of his men were killed. And their bodies were all tossed in the tide. Now, in 133 BC, one body got tossed, Tiberius. In 21, 121 BC, 12 years later, 600 bodies got tossed. See how things progress? You go from one act of political violence to it just, the political violence was just accelerated. And what would happen would be eventually this political violence would uh, expand to a full-on civil war within Rome. And that would, that would be the next stage of the, of the Roman Revolution. All right. Well, we've gone for quite a while here. Um, why don't we uh, take a little break here for a couple minutes, and uh, and so we'll do that now. When you take your break, y'all can uh, finish your forms if you haven't graded yourself yet. But uh, I have a question for you. Now, you all need this stretch, and you all need to use the facilities and all that. But I have a question for you. I want you to think: What are the now? Mer uh, people have always kind of compared America to Rome, because the Roman Republic was the inspiration to um, the American Republic. You know, we had a Senate, the Romans had a Senate, and so forth. If we have veto, they had veto, right? So, so we've seen the problems of the um, Roman Republic. What were, you know, so first of all, you want to identify what were the problems facing Rome during the Roman Republic? What were some of the big problems facing the Roman Republic? the society of Rome in the 2nd century during the, during the Roman Revolution. 
And then I want you to think about, does America have any similar problems? Could we, could our republic similarly be at risk? Because, so think of those, just think of those in the back of your mind, and for, it'll take about five minutes, seven minutes or so, and, and then we'll get back and I'll ask a group or two to, to let, give me their opinion. All right, folks. Um, what do you got for me? Uh, we got. Let's get go going on this uh, group uh, six. Who's group six? Yeah, what what do you, Dave, you got anything? What were some of the problems that Rome faced because of the Roman Revolution? Uh, we want the proletariat the same time, basically, with our will for our system. Well, you can make a comparison between the proletariat and uh, you know, like you know, like uh, our, our government services or welfare. Yeah, and also, I think uh, both that. Uh, Matters abroad, as far as taking being concerned about foreign affairs as opposed to taking care of your own. Oh, at home, yeah. yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Um, what, you got anything else, or <laughs> any other group? So, so some of the things they pointed out was that the Rome was fighting all these wars overseas, you know, during the, this period, and. Uh, and, and, and you pointed out that you know a lot of people complain that the United States spends more time in Iraq and Afghanistan than it does building roads or whatever here. Uh, or what was the other one? It's not the proletariat and our welfare system today, as far as I think it's getting out of hand. So the proletariat got a lot of they got free grain. Remember, they got is getting free grain. They got and but uh, and you could make a point that, that some people say that we have a similar system where we, we have you know a lot of Poor people who well, collect government benefits. I think both, both parties spent more time just taking, kind of pushing to the side and, and doing what it took just to satisfy them instead of actually getting them back to, back to work just like today. Throwing them a bone. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just, uh, why not making productive citizens instead of just. Yeah, because that's harder. I know it's hard, it's hard, <laughs> hard to do that. But yeah. You made the comment that. that the Romans always saw themselves as the great liberators. So they would go in and liberate, and then when somebody else would come in, then it put them in an obligation to, to you know, basically yeah. defend what they had liberated. That's true. In order to protect themselves, it's no different than the United States. We go in to liberate somebody, and then rather than them taking care of themselves, it's up to us to to nursemaid them indefinitely, which costs us money, and as a result, right. we don't get things taken care of here at home. Senators in the Washington D.C. are still more concerned with making money on their own, their backdoor dealings with their, their uh, uh, the uh, lobbyists and things of that nature, and their book deals after they get out of the Senate. So they're not really worried about what they're doing to, for us. And yeah, it's up to the poor people to stand up and rise up and demand change, but then the poor people don't feel like they even have a voice three fourths of the time. So it's very similar. A lot of the people don't think it's there. Yeah. What were you going to say something? Well, just like the uh, thought that came to my mind, just like the Middle East with Iraq, Iran, all this through the last several decades that uh, you were talking about uh, in Greece. You know, they kind of went in and defeated them, but let them basically run themselves again, and we see what happened. They just come right back, and it's basically the same problem we had. Yeah. You know, it's just decades apart, but same, it's just a different country over there, but the same problem coming back. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to liberate people. You're just not going. <laughs> you're trying to lose a battle there, I think. Well, historically, you 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 would find it hard hard be hard pressed to find a case where you went to liberate people and they everything turned. Everybody points out uh, the the model for Iraq, of course, was Germany and Japan, which did eventually create stable democratic governments. But uh, you know that that took a lot of time and money on our part, and eventually they paid off. But you know. So I guess that would be that would be a, a success story. But for for most history, it's a pretty tough job to do that. And the Romans really opened a can of worms when they started doing the great city states. You have to decide whether it's a success story or not, because there's two ways of defeating somebody. You can defeat them militarily, or you can defeat them over the long run and economically. We set up Germany and Japan. We spent millions and billions of dollars building up their economy, getting them to where that they were successful and productive, and then they outdo us. Well, you know, the fact of the matter is that we're doing the same thing with China. You know, how do you th where do you think China gets all their money to build their industry and their, and their factory? Well, our money, our debt. Yeah, we're nursing off of China and selling our soul to them, thanks to this 
So yeah, we do have, uh, so, but anyway, but, uh, so that was a good discussion. We gotta get going here. So let's, uh, what I wanna do now uh, is talk about what happened next. Uh, we talked about the, the, the Gracchus brothers, the Gracchi as they're known. Now, the, 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 this whole experience, uh, the, when both men were killed, uh, it led a lot of bad blood. And so Romans became divided politically into partisan groups based on whether you liked what the Gracchi did or whether you disliked it. Now, the uh, people who thought that the Gracchi were great, the people who thought that what they were trying to do to help the masses was wonderful and would, would take Rome in a new direction, they called themselves the Populares, the, uh, the, the party of the people. That's what Populares means. Now, um, people who thought that the Gracchi were breaking the traditions of Roman, the Roman Republic and were uh, unconstitutional and were tyrants and demagogues, they called themselves the best people, the optimates, and they, they believed that Rome needed to be guided by its traditional Roman nobles, you know, the old, the senatorial elite, and these were the people best fit to run Rome, and that the, the common people ought to follow where the best people, the optimates, go. So Rome was divided up into these political factions, and these political factions were so violent that eventually they would erupt into civil war. That's one reason why uh, all of our founding fathers said that political parties would be the worst thing that could ever happen to America. Hated political parties. That's, you don't see the word political party anywhere in the United States Constitution, and there's a reason for it, because all of our founding fathers, Jefferson, Madison, Washington, all of them, thought that political parties were the worst thing that could happen to a country because they divided the citizen groups into different, different interest groups that would be destructive to the republic. And what they all looked to was the example of Rome because partisanship resulted in civil war and the death of the republic. So you see, Romans were divided into these two bitter camps, Populares and Optimates. Now, the Populares found a champion in the person of Marius. Here's a picture of Marius. Marius came uh, was what the Romans called a new man, novus homo. A new man is somebody who had success at running for office, whose family had no tradition of serving in office before. He, he was from a very wealthy family, Italian family, uh, but he was the first person in his family ever to get elected to high office. And um, he was a war hero. And um, in, uh, turns out what happened was that in, in in uh, 112, between 112 and 106 BC, Rome got bogged down in a war against King Jugurtha of Numidia. Now, Numid Numidia is what is today would be parts of Algeria and Tunisia, it's in North Africa. And what had happened is that uh, um, the Roman bankers, Roman, Roman merchants and Roman bankers had provided money for Jugurtha's enemies. He was involved in a struggle for the throne with his brothers. Numidia was just this desert kingdom in the middle of nowhere. It was just a bunch of, it wasn't much of a kingdom at all. But what had happened was that uh, since these Italian bankers had supported Jugurtha's rivals, when Jugurtha assumed the throne, he murdered a bunch of Italians. And the Romans couldn't allow some foreign government to murder their own citizens. So Rome went to war against Jugurtha, but it was an embarrassing war because Jugurtha had this tiny little army and they were running circles around the Romans. And it turned out that Rome was running out of troops. They, they, they didn't have that many citizen farmers left to fight in their wars for them. And they were running out of money, running out of troops. And the senators that were sent to fight against Jugurtha, um, some of the senators were accepting bribes from Jugurtha not to fight. So it was a really, it was a really terrible situation. Now Marius, in 107 BC, Marius ran to be consul. And when he ran for consul, he said, look, these senators, these traditional senators, they're a bunch of crooks. They're all a bunch of uh, weakening. They, they don't know how to fight. And, and uh, I've been fighting all my life. You know, you know, when he ran for office, know how he would campaign? He would take off his shirt. You think, what, taking off his shirt? Because he was covered with scars. All, and he didn't have a single scar on his back, but he had scars all over his face, all over his, all over his, because this guy had been in wars since he was a kid. He was a, he was a veteran of many wars. So Marius could say, look, you look at these fat senators, these fat, soft senators, I dare them to take off their shirts. You won't find a single mark on them because they don't know how to fight. I know how to fight. And so the, the, the Roman people said, this is a man. And he got elected. 
And he was a popular. So he got elected, and, and uh, this is what he did new. Instead of, he went to the proletariat, the poorest of the poor, and said, look, sign up to fight for me, and when it's all over, you'll get land as a reward for your loyal service to Rome. So he recruited an army of proletariat, of the poorest of the poor, and he trained them, and then he took his new army, and he just beat the pants off Jakarta. I mean, he got, he, Jakarta was defeated and captured within a year. And so people said, this is Marius, man, this guy takes care of business. And so then, Rome would have another crisis on its hands. This is where the, you hear about the Cimbri and the Teutonics. They, these were Germanic tribes, they were Germans, that, that in, in about 105 BC, they had crossed the Rhine River from, from Germany into what is today Gaul, and the, in the southern Gaul, and they were threatening Italy itself. These were, this, was, this was a whole people on the move. They had their wives, their children, they were, they were traveling in wagons, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And Rome was under threat. So, so uh, to deal with the threat, the people said, we need a leader. So they elected Marius, because he had a track record of success. And he had a great success. He defeated the Cimbri and the Teutonics. And uh, he did it with his army of proletariat trained professional soldiers. They're very proud of him. They loved him. His troops loved him. They called him, uh, they, called him uh, they were called Marius' mules. Because he always put them to work. He got them to shape. You know, he, he tell them to dig ditches <coughs> just to get in shape. And he, he was always getting them working all the time. But they loved this guy. And uh, he, whenever he went, when he, when he was fighting wars, he did the Lou Holtz thing. I don't know if you guys know, know Lou Holtz, but uh, he was a famous uh, coach at Notre Dame. He was, when, when he was about to go battle against the, the, uh, the two Tonys, uh, he told his men, these guys are just too tough for you guys. I'm, I'm not going to let you fight them. Because they're just too tough. They'll kick your butt, you know. So he, he purposely kept them from fighting, right? See, the, and the, the story goes that the Teutonics were huge, and they would scare the crap out of because they were very intimidating. You know, they had these naked guys with covered with tattoos, and they'd scream all these, you know, and, the, and, and, and then, and so all the Romans were initially scared of them. But it was a good strategy because the Romans got used to these guys. He saw them every day. But then, but, but, but he would say, look, you know, don't fight them because they'll, they'll kill you. Just don't even get close to these guys. You guys aren't ready yet. You guys aren't ready yet. You guys got to stay here because they're too strong for you. But the Romans were thinking, oh, these guys aren't so bad. We can take them. We can take them. And the story goes is that uh, the Romans and the Teutonians were at the stream. They were, looking, they were getting water. And, and they started a full-on brawl with these guys. So these guys are like fighting a brawl in the riddle of this river. And Mari says, okay, my men are ready to fight now. They're not scared of these guys anymore. So we led them into battle, and they just won the day. They, they killed everybody. They wiped them all out. Now, the, sto the story goes is that so many Germans were killed that um, the, the local farmers used to use the bones of the dead to make fences for their farms. And that you, you could smell the stench of death for years because thousands upon thousands of men were slaughtered by the Romans. It was a great victory. Now, the other story is that when the Romans, Romans were thinking, okay, we're, we're, now we're going like, to take with their women and their children. But instead of being captured, the Teutonian women hung themselves. So when they got to the camp, they found thousands and thousands of women dead, and they killed their own. First, they killed their children, and then they killed themselves because they'd rather be dead than be slaves and slaves of the Romans. But anyway, so I mean, they basically in a single battle, I mean, you had genocide. I mean, basically they wiped out an entire tribe in, after the battle and with the mass suicide of the women and children following the battle. So Marius, Marius had great success. He, he was the savior of Rome. He had to save Rome from these great enemies, and. Uh, in uh, 100 BC, uh, in, after defeating the Cimbri and Teutonics, he went to the Roman Senate. He went to the Roman people and said, "Okay, these men who I recruited, who I trained, they've served Rome, they've saved Rome. Now it's time for the people to give them their land." And so he had one of his followers, a tribune, go to the plebeian assembly and present a bill that would give all this land to these veterans to honor them for their service. Well, the senators always, these, these optimates, they always hated Marius. And they weren't going to let this happen, just out of spite. They didn't care that these guys had fought for Rome. They just didn't like Marius. So before the guy could even make, present the bill, a bunch of senators and their hired guns, their thugs, went in there and they beat the guy to death and they killed him. Now the story is, is that he, he, he fled into the Senate building thinking he'd be safe. That would, the, would the senators kill him in his own building? He went to the Senate building. And he hid there. And the senators 
tore open the roof to get to him, and then pelted him with br roof tiles and basically stoned him to death. I mean, centered him for throwing rocks at this guy until they killed him. And then they, they said, no more money, there's no land for farmers, no land for the soldiers. And they were thinking that uh, this would be a big embarrassment for Marius. But what happened is that the, the common people of Rome and the veterans, they blamed the Senate. They said, look, you can't trust these senators. You know, we fought for Rome, we got nothing. So it, 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 all it did was, they were trying to make Marius look bad, but the senators just hurt their own credibility with the people of Rome. Now, what happened next was that uh, the next big crisis Rome, that Rome faced was a decade later. Uh, Rome had relied on all these allies, these Italian allies, for so long to fight their wars for them. And eventually these Italian allies, um, they had enough. You know, they were fighting Rome's wars for them, but they had no voice in the government. So what happened is that many of Rome's closest allies in Italy rose up. It's called the Social War. It comes from the Roman word for allies. It could be called the Al War of the Allies. Saki means allies. And uh, this war tore Rome apart. Now, um, eventually, the war ended because Rome granted an amnesty to all the Italians who had, who had rebelled and granted full citizenship to all Italians. So basically, once the allies were given Roman citizenship, there was no reason for them to fight anymore, and the rebellion ended, but only after a great loss of life. Now, on top of that, while Rome was having this internal war within Italy, what happened was that there was a massive rebellion in Asia Minor and in Greece. Now, a, a ruler in Asia Minor, and what is today Turkey, named Mithridates, there's a coin of his, Mithridates knew that, that the Romans were very unpopular in Greece and very popular in Asia Minor and, and had a reputation for corruption and, and uh, cruelty and, and, and uh, exploitation. So he declared himself as a king who came as a liberator to free these people from Roman rule. So now Rome had to deal with a big war to the east. So they just finished a war against uh, they just finished a war against their own allies, and now in 88 BC they were facing a war overseas. Now, in 88 BC, what happened was that uh, the Roman the Roman uh, people, the, the plebeian assembly, they wanted to send Marius to uh, to fight against Mithridates. You know, he was getting old now; he was, he was almost pushing 80. But they wanted him to come in because he had, he, they were still loved him. They still remembered all that Marius had done. But the Roman Senate had decided, the Roman Senate had decided to send one of their own, a man by the name of Sulla, who was a very conservative optimate. He had the support of the Roman Senatorial League, and they decided to send him to fight Mithridates. So what happened was that Sulla was uh, on the coast with his army that he had he had gone to the proletariat and raised his own army, just like Marius had done. But he had his army ready to go to fight against Mithridates, and he got word that the plebeian assembly had voted to get rid of him and to replace him as commander with Marius. And this is what Sulla did. Sulla went to the Rome, he went to his own army and said, look, you know that the way the political system works, you might not get land, but I promise if you, if you follow me into Rome and you help me seize power in Rome, I personally promise you I will get you that land. And these Roman soldiers who were you know, poor proletariat in origin, they figured, hey, this guy promised the Roman Senate and the Roman political system, there's nothing they can get me. But this guy, this dictator, if I follow him, he's going to get me land. So in 88 BC, Sulla marched on Rome, and there was a bloodbath. He murdered all the supporters of Marius, as many as he could find. Marius went into hiding. And, and, and then he established himself, he, he, he made himself dictator, and when he, things had calmed down, he went off to fight Mithridates. So, so that many people see the march on Rome in 88 BC as the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic. Because it was at this point that the common Roman citizen, the citizen soldier, was willing to follow a dictator and attack his own people rather than obey the laws of the land and obey the Constitution and follow through the political process. So many people see the march on Rome by Sulla in 88 BC as the beginning of the end of the Roman Republic and the beginning of a of a military dictator. All right, we're going to take a we're going to stop here for today, but we're going to talk about the, the military dictatorship and the. And
justice and uh, get the fall of Rome. Hopefully we'll get to that and we'll do that on uh, next week.